Hi, I'm Jim Eaves, and you're listening to the Honest Filmmaker podcast, career advice from people in the business. Today, I'm joined by writer-director Graham Hughes. Graham's directed four feature films and joins us fresh from his latest film, Hostile Dimensions, premiere screening at this year's Fright Fest Film Festival, as well as screening a number of high-profile genre festivals since. We talked about film festivals, getting into them. We talked about talent labs and how they worked and some of the things to look out for when working with a sales agent. Enjoy. You've had, in the time I've known you and before that, you've had some success with like awards and what was the one I've got on here? BAFTA New Talent Awards and film festivals and stuff like that. What's been your sort of finest moment so far, would you say? Well, that BAFTA New Talent Award, that was similar to like, graduating from uni you know coming out of uni be like well I'm off to be a director now and then getting my hopes like severely dashed uh the next time that happened was um when we won um myself and my co-writers at the time won the Bath New Talent Award for writing on that um 200 pound uh, <laughs> first feature um and I remember being so naive that it was like right we've we've won this award I'll just you know put my feet up and wait for the phone to ring <laughs> <laughs> um which made sense at the time because it's like right well this is like an entry level award for writing surely you know if you're a talent scout or something you're going to be looking for those kind of things but um yeah how how naive i was <laughs> so like the of all the festivals and all of the things that i've done i think by far the most um impactful has been fright fest in 2019 oh, really? yeah. yeah um yeah like because i've done festivals prior to that and um i'd always struggled to find an audience even um i think edinburgh might might be like the highest profile um festival that i've had a film in and even there it was like we sold out um like two of the three screens so we had like about six, at least 600 people saw it over the the course of the weekend and or the festival or whatever um but after that there was just like nothing mm. um we got maybe like two reviews there was just and that was kind of the end of it and um i'm not saying like festivals need to do x in order to be valuable um, yeah. it was still like a really valuable experience for me um but fright fest was just completely different the amount of um press that they had um that engaged and like watched all the screeners and wrote about the film um and then the audiences as well were really vocal um and i don't know if that's a difference between the festivals or between the films um mm -hmm. but um yeah there's no way to control for that i guess so that, all i can say is that fright fest just really kind of got my name out there and the film out there in a way that I hadn't really experienced with any other kind of like talent lab or or like award or anything like that mm. and you've done pretty well at festivals um with both those two films apart apart from having a good film which I'm, I'm not seeing the new one I'm sure it is love death of a vlogger apart from having a good film are there any tips to getting into festivals do you think or is it literally a good film you get in or how strategic are you with who, who you apply to? Um, so I'm in a unique position, maybe not unique. I'm in a, a privileged position now that, um, so Hostel Dimensions, um, from the get go had a sales agent, a uh, sales agency attached, um, Blue Finch. And, um, that's been night and day, uh, for the festival experience because, I have nothing to do to do with oh, really? it. Really, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm allowed to, you know, have conversations with them, and just if there's any festivals that I have my eye on, mm. uh, then like I can sort of gently persuade them to to apply. Um, so for instance, I don't think, I'm not sure if they were going to send it to Edinburgh, but you know, it's not an Edinburgh film, mm. and also this year they ran at a reduced capacity because I don't know if you've seen all, all of the bankruptcy stuff yeah um but i just sort of said to the team like i've got priors with edinburgh i think we should just get it in front of them yeah like they'll knock it back but can you at least get like pa pass it their way um but beyond that they're totally in charge of um who they're submitting to who they're talking to and they've got the whole strategy down and i'm just kind of like 
happy to let them do their thing. Mm. Um, and they already have like all the connections and relationships with all of the festivals that they deem are important. Um, so that that's the answer to getting into film festivals is like knowing someone that knows. Um, because it's interesting you um, <laughs> it's interesting that you you uh, think that Death of a Vlogger did well in the festival circuit because I think we maxed out at about four. Oh really? Yeah, but they seem to unless I'm remembering it wrong, they seem to be pretty good festivals. They were good. pretty like yeah, there was um, I'll tell you exactly off the top of my head. It was Fright Fest London, Fright Fest Glasgow. Uh, Cinequest and Terra Mullins. Yeah. So, so when you look at, and I've been through the milk festivals, but when you yeah. look at the list, there's a lot of festivals you could get into. Um, and, the, and the whole, is it even worth getting into festivals debate is an interesting one. Um, yeah. yeah. But there's a lot of festivals you can get into, but it's just, just meaningless. Whereas there are yeah. certain festivals like Fright Fests, like the one, is it Motel X? Is that the one you've just got? Yeah. Yeah, yeah ones yeah. like that that people have heard of that have got good exposure. That That's probably why when I look at Death of a Vlogger, I'm like, oh, that did well because it was in ones I'd heard of. But it's awesome that you're in that position and you're not having to deal with all the ball ache and I'm assuming and the expense of submitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah, the... um within our contract uh and this is just useful stuff to know i'm sure mm. you've seen contracts like this as well um the it's like standard know, like sales agency agreement or something like that SAA. Yeah. um there's a market cap so you've got your um you've got your agreement uh and it says in there there's marketing and sales fees that come out of the first money you own once you sell your film yeah. And 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 I'm assuming at the moment no territories have been sold yet. They're trying to build the momentum, are they? Or yeah, yeah. yeah. So they've been talking with yeah various territories, buyers, and all that. And um, yeah, I think the next the next couple of months will be crucial. Just um, as I said, we've got other festivals that have programmed as Barn announced yet, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, just building all that um momentum, I guess. But mm -hmm. again, it's very like I'm, I'm kind of hands off on this one, which I'm really glad. <laughs> for it. as you know yourself there's like a million jobs in making a film and very few of them are actually directing fun um, <laughs> very yeah. few of them are fun yeah um, are fun yeah, yeah. Um, um but yeah i think to like to go back a bit as well um so my experience with my three films before hostile dimensions i did all the festival stuff myself and yeah, encountered exactly what you're talking about. It's just all of these very um, predatory um, sham festivals, essentially. And um, yeah, I think people just need to make sure they're doing their research and not just like on film freeway and like, oh, this one's only a fiver, right? It's like, why not? Um, and yeah, just being smart. I think uh, I think with Death of a Vlogger, I could afford ultimately could afford to submit to 40 film mm. festivals so we had a 10 percent um success rate which i think is actually pretty good <laughs> um, uh but yeah it, i think the other thing as well i i i genuinely believe that death of a vlogger is a better film than hostile dimensions and oh, yeah really? oh, i right. i think so yeah, yeah. um and I mean, they're both great. They're both yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think that just shows how much the game is rigged and that um, Hostile Dimensions is doing much better on the festival circuit mm. compared to Death of a Vlogger because, like, Vlogger was all cold submissions. Mm -hmm. um, and any festival will tell you. There, there are outliers, obviously, but... Um, so, for instance, the year that we got into... Edinburgh was an absolute miracle because they told us that they programmed three films from 2000 submissions and then the rest of the um the rest of the program probably about 70 films or thereabouts were all um through things that the programmers had seen at other festivals or relationships that they already had with sales agents and yeah. and filmmakers and certain remits that have to be ticked or purely just yeah the taste of the programmers seeking out films that they know are coming mm. um so yeah it's a shit position to be in but that's like 
that's going to be the reality for most like first time filmmakers yeah so so the advice there is be careful don't enter any old crap check yeah. do your research um if you can get a sales agent to do it for you fabulous <laughs> even better yeah <laughs> yeah even better um and i guess when i think back to festival stuff i do wonder for myself anyway the sales that we have made on films if it's even made a difference maybe that's yeah. because i've not done the big fright fest one yet i've not um we've had a couple of on previous previous films but um yeah I, I just wonder i guess you've really got to think that strategy through and think is it going to be worth because it's the soon add up i mean if you said 40 40 festivals you entered i mean how much is are we talking that's yeah totally. thousands isn't it it's, I think because I was very careful with it, um, some European ones you can get for free as well. Like if right, you right. if you get them at the right time, they'll be, their early bird will actually be free. Mm. Um, yeah, I think in the end, I probably spent about uh, probably about 400, 500 pounds on. Yeah. So across 40 submissions, I actually managed to keep the cost right down low. Mm. Um there's some that just totally took mad chunks out of the budget, like certain film fest, like I'm trying to think what, because I don't think I even sent it by like South by Southwest or yeah. Slam Dance. I was very kind of pragmatic and what, like you know you've you've made a film, you might not ne you might not ever make another one. You should probably just whack into South by just in the off chance. Mm -hmm. But I didn't because I was like, I can't really justify that seventy quid on one submission that like the odds of success for that are like what two percent maybe less yeah it's tough isn't it like i've said this the other day to somebody but we submitted our first very very first feature to can to the can film festival That's oh wow naive we were <laughs> so we thought, oh this film with um you know like plastic monsters and uh set in a mental hospital Karen's gonna love that. They're gonna eat that up. <laughs> They'll, you know, picturing yourself on the red carpet. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the other one that I've got to say that I always hear this with filmmakers, this drives me nuts, is one is trying to finish your film before a festival. Is going, I've got to get yeah. the film finished. Fright Fest deadlines next week. Got to get the film finished. And the other one is Fright Fest deadlines next week. I'll just send them a version of it. I'll send it. Mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? It's not finished. I'll send it as it is, just so they can see it. Yeah. Never, I would say never do that. Never, never send something that's not finished because they won't view it as something that's not finished. Yeah. Um, and never give yourself a, a film festival deadline because you're only going to be disappointed because chances are the one that you really, really want, you won't get. Yeah. 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 I agree with both of those. Um, we we did actually set, end up sending out um, Hostile Dimensions in a in an early cut, um, but I think that was more because was in bed with the sales agents mm. the, we're kind of working to a schedule together yeah but that with the big caveat that because they have relationships with the festivals they can they know how to phrase a, a work in progress letter yeah and they can you know, assure like, them yeah the exactly that it's gonna... yeah so even just having that mark of like le so-called legitimacy um I think is is enough to just or like I I trust their judgment if that if they're used to doing this and they're used to looking mm. at those kind of cuts fine but um I'm in a similar mindset of you like get it to them they're only going to watch it once they will never you know they won't watch a later cut they so. won't go oh well it's the sound's not finished maybe that will change it I'll watch it when it they send the new one you know it's like sending someone a script yeah. that's not finished it's that big mistake yeah yeah totally. um so um we met on the Edinburgh International Film Festival Talent Lab, which I'm guessing doesn't exist anymore. You know, they've had financial troubles. Oh. I guess the Talent Lab's part of it. That's coming um, back. Um or... yeah, good question. I, I think I think they'll bring it back. Because I, I mean the, the fest the festival's coming back like yeah. as big as ever, as far as I oh, know. Oh really? Oh um, that's good news. I, I think so, yeah. So like this year, um it was yeah, reduced capacity mm. while it was like a changing of the guard. Um, and I think the plan is next year it's going to go back to, well, a, a version of its former self. And have you done, so is Edinburgh the only talent lab you've done? Have you done other ones? 
Uh, I did the Reykjavik Film Festival Talent Lab. And um, so, so for people who don't know what a talent lab is, what is a talent lab and how do you apply to them? So various film festivals and film like bodies, I guess, uh, run talent labs, which are basically an excuse to get um, a bunch of filmmakers at a roughly similar stage in their career, usually early stage, together for a big piss up. <laughs> <laughs> and also some like lectures and networking and um workshops and things like that yeah okay that's a good description yeah because <laughs> I, I think um i think it was a miracle i got on that edinburgh one because of my genre background i don't know yeah. if things have changed but I, I do feel like i was a bit of a kind of um strange anomaly in that lineup especially when you network with other people and everyone else has got these kind of um earnest projects that they really believe yeah. in that real like <laughs> social economic commentary yeah and you're like oh my one's about a you know time traveling man or whatever you can kill <laughs> people or something um, yeah so I think it was a bit of a miracle but i've got to say for students um if they've got a feature under their belt that's done well I think talent labs are brilliant. I think they're a good way to meet people, you know, yeah. um, in a similar situation to yourself. And those lectures and those piss ups are, you know, a really, really big opportunity. And a lot of students don't even know those things exist. So I'd, yeah. I'd say, well, I, I wouldn't be here right now, mm. uh, literally right here, if it wasn't for the Edinburgh Film Festival talent lab. Because, well, and you wouldn't have one of the greatest cameos in movie history in exactly. Death of a Vlogger, yeah. which you think, <laughs> what do you fucking do? Let's just leave it at that. Yes, um, exactly. Yes, and I should say, Death of a Vlogger, I, I was doing research today, four stars in total film. Um, where can people actually watch that now? Oh, I have no clue. No clue, okay. <laughs> Link is in the description. Let's Google. Um, I, I think Amazon is what I'm going to say. I think I think it's on like some uh, like plugin on Amazon. Uh, watch with Channel One Hundred One. Start your seven-day free trial now. Oh, okay. So there you go. <laughs> Let's get a little ad um, in there. Okay, just will... uh, sign up to that. Make yep. sure you uh, tick the box that says "Do not auto renew," and you're good to go. Good to go. You can watch it. Uh, can you? And I'm assuming you can repeat watch it over those seven days as many times as you want to. Yeah, because you're going to want to watch it every day. Yeah. For each of those seven days at um, least once a day at least once a day so so then and again, again haven't seen hostile dimensions but the vibe i'm getting from the trailer is found footage style action cameras you know real life stuff horror dot slash sci-fi um death of the vlogger similar sort of vibe why what what's what's made you go down that route that kind of like realistic kind of webcams gopros all that kind of stuff um so there's like two two kind of reasons one was like pragmatic and one was artistic um so the basically i had tried to get a third feature off the ground after practical guide um i'd scraped together like 10 grand for it and uh yeah like i I just put put everything into it for like two years basically like another feature film a horror that was contained um and it was one of the worst experiences of my life it it, it all fell apart literally about two weeks before the shoot um and it was kind of potentially salvageable but i was so exhausted at that point i just i, I had to just like pull the whole plug on the thing and um yeah that was a fucking disaster and I think the big issue for that for me was I think if I'd had one of three elements it might have worked and, and the, the three things that were kind of missing was I had a full-time job so I didn't have the time to kind of do everything I needed to do um, I didn't have a dedicated producer so I was wearing both of those hats uh, as well as like the other dozen um, and the third thing was it it we only had 10 grand so we didn't have money for things i didn't have time for things and i didn't have help for things mm -hmm. 
and um, the combination of all that, that just like um, I took on too much and couldn't get it made. Mm. So um, that was like the third time that I'd given up filmmaking <laughs> at that point. Um, so I gave up filmmaking for a while and then watched the film called The Dirties, um, which is a found footage um, kind of comedy drama about um, a school shooting. And uh, it totally like opened up my eyes to the potential for found footage um, because this was still kind of, in my opinion, still in the sort of lull of found footage where a bunch of really good stuff came out and then everyone just tried to like copy the good stuff. Um, everyone realized that this was like a money spinner because you can make it for dirt cheap and um, and yeah, just like pump the market and like there was so much absolute shite out there um, and a lot of the good stuff didn't manage to rise to the top and like found footage just became this dirty word and uh, re -watch, like watching the dirties um, it, so not a horror for a start um, it was just a guy who was like well this is what I have and I'm going to make this my aesthetic mm -hmm. um, rather than what I was doing with the film that fell apart, which was I'm trying to make a 10 grand film look like a like half million pound film. Yeah. And just stretching everything to try and make that work. Whereas this guy was like, I've got 10 grand. It looks like it costs 10 grand, but the filmmaking is really clever. The performances are all great and the writing is brilliant. So it's like all the things that well, I guess you could say performances can be impacted by the budget but those three things generally like are not impacted by budget if you've got the time and the space to to like you know um sit down and write then you can make something that's a really quality piece of work but doesn't have to look like you know the big boys so to speak mm -hmm. um and then from then i was like oh, okay maybe i can make like a found footage film and i started watching like all like basically retracing the last 10 years and finding out where the good ones were and just seeing like this absolute wealth of amazing films and it was like okay i just became like a mad found footage junkie <laughs> at that point um so that was the two reasons that led to the death of a vlogger it was like pragmatic and then just realizing that like how much can actually be done artistically with it yeah and i i imagine again from the trailer I can see you've used low tech solutions and camera trickery and a bit like death of a vlogger to 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 make things appear to get those shot value and to kind of get the action across. So it sort of it makes perfect sense. Um, so you obviously are you in are you in uh, the new one? Yes. Are you the star of the new one? I am not the star. Of this You're time. not the star. Of it. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, so so you're obviously death of the vlogger you're right up front central was that a decision again was that budget related was that i want to do this or what what and at what point did you get over because you there must have been a bit where you were like oh is this me putting me in it is that gonna work what yeah. how, when did you get over uh, it and what point did you make that decision yeah totally because all the acting had done up to that point was well the first feature that I made just because it was like me and all my pals none of us were actors um and then I'd made like loads of sketches as well for um like the BBC ran this um this initiative called the social I don't know if it's still going but um there was like little bits of money for Scottish filmmakers to, or like well Scottish artists of any kind of um media um to yeah just like shoot stuff and um they would like broadcast it on their page and that so like i'd done quite a lot of sketches um just starring in them myself as well um because it was only like a hundred pounds commission so mm. not enough to pay anyone to <laughs> to do the bits and um it was through that that basically when it came to death of a vlogger it's like oh, i can use all of this like vlogging experience i've got and like making these little skits and things like i felt quite comfortable in front of the ca camera um, still don't consider myself an actor but just comfortable enough that if I write it in a certain way I can um, be convincing as as my a version of myself mm. and uh, also just um, 
it gave me the the freedom um for the shoot so um even even after like uh tentatively going okay I'll, I'll maybe make another film um and kind of write started writing it and uh i was still like not sure if it would work or not um so the film was shot like over about six months i think and it would just be you know still holding down a full-time job so it'd just be like walking home from work being like have i got <laughs> have i got energy like i'm a f- I'll, okay i'll do a scene tonight and like it was set in my flat as well so i could just sit down and shot on my phone it's so literally just like sit down with the phone and like shoot a pretty simple scene and then get it in the computer and see how it's looking and i just sort of edited as i went as well so it was all kind of like a piecemeal sort of iterative like um sort of process and uh i, I didn't fully commit to it i think until about three months in mm. when i had maybe about 40 minutes shot and roughly edited and i was like no th- okay this is this is a thing this is actually a thing now <laughs> and it was like from that point, I was like, okay, now I'm actually making a film. But the, the whole first half of the shoot was just sort of like um, all the actors that I'd kind of roped in for like the odds Saturday or Sunday shoot, just a couple hours at a time. All of them, I was like, look, just so you know, I may bin this. <laughs> like, I may inspiring. The that is inspiring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I was full of confidence, clearly. <laughs> I may have been this. I'm going to ask you for your motto later. Maybe that's going to be uh, your motto. My motto, oh this. man. <laughs> um, so, and how do you know when you're the lead? How do you know what you're doing is good? Is it like, oh, I can just feel it in my bones that that was a good take, or is there somebody sanity checking that for you? Um, to date, just feeling it myself. Yeah, I, I will. I will ask. Um. If there's other cast around, mm. what they thought, <laughs> but I think that's like maybe that's undue pressure as well when they've got their own shit to deal with. Yeah, and um, they're probably thinking if I say he's crap, he's going to bin the whole project. <laughs> he's already <laughs> threatened. <laughs> I might bin this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Annabelle is always really supportive. So Annabelle, I've made three films with now. Yeah, um, and she's um, a brilliant actor and is always very supportive whenever I'm acting with, with her or <laughs> if she's around she's like always um got really good advice and mm-hmm. she's actually directed me a few times um as well which has been really useful particularly on death of a vlogger and um, gave me some good tips um but yeah it's as soon as I can afford not to I'll not act <laughs> in my films <laughs> um and you went to Cannes this year? Yes. That's right. Yes. Was that your first can or not? It was, can... yeah. It was. And what would you make of it? What'd you think? Uh, it was interesting. You've been, right? Oh, I'm a veteran, yeah. I've been yeah, for yeah. a while, but I love it. I've, yeah. Like, used to go every single year, had children, and we've kind of eased off of that. Although they're getting big now, soon they'll be able to fend for themselves, so we can Aww. go back and <laughs> get drunk. But um, what was your experience like? uh yeah it was was really interesting i had a great time um but it's a weird place (laughs) um pretty depressing in a lot of ways uh more depressing than inspiring i would say oh really why is that um i think we just realize how much stuff is out there Mm -hmm. like um so yeah for any listeners that don't know um the there is an actual market, like a literal, it's not like, I thought the Marche de film was like a sort of metaphor or, <laughs> you know, like uh, people will come in, it's a market of ideas, but no, there's literally stalls with people like going, film for sale, <laughs> come get your hot films here. <laughs> like it's pro- yes. I was so like, what? Okay. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it, like, you know, people need a place to hold meetings and that, but it's just funny to actually see the market. And um, I think it was just the sheer volume of companies that I had never heard of um, and films that I'd never heard of that, um, yeah, depressed me a little bit. Um, Especially because, like, I feel like I've got my finger on the pulse with horror films. Mm. So, like, kind of being... At the market and just being like oh shit there's so much out like this year that 
yeah, it just it's, it's overwhelming. It is, but then I guess one thing you've got to bear in mind with that market is, like you said, you know, um, found footage does well, and then there's a million found footage films. Yeah, the marche sometimes it reflects trends that have come for bigger budget films five years earlier. Yeah, and there'll be yeah. a certain type of horror that will just be everywhere. Yeah. Um, and it would be, it'll all be trash. Um, mm. So it's kind of bearing that in mind. I know what you mean. Oh, I love I love going around and taking pictures of the some of the posters are just like, <laughs> Pandasaurus was one I saw. You know, <laughs> the, yeah, it's like a killer panda dinosaur thing. Um, I love all that stuff, and it sometimes feels like the Eric Roberts Film Festival. He seems to be in every action <laughs> film going. Oh. <laughs> um, so um, what? lessons have you learned from your previous film and maybe going into this one as far as distribution goes be very careful who you get into bed with um talk to your friends uh talk to friends of friends um i think go to film festivals and see if you can meet people there that um no more than you uh so the the sales agents that i got for death of a vlogger i am not happy with mm. at all um and i had asked uh someone i met at edinburgh um who works in in sales i was like basically only really had one offer and i was like i've got this offer from these people what do you think and he was like, ah, they're a bit sharky, but okay. And um, I later relayed this quote to like a friend after, um, after I'd signed with him. And I was like, so he said they were okay. <laughs> and, and my friend was like, that's not the word that stood out to me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I, you know, time will tell with. Uh, sales agents I'm with just now, but I've got nothing but good things to say about them so far. They're mm -hmm. a lovely bunch of people and have been taking good care of me in the film. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think in general, they're... most sales agents aren't out for you or the filmmaker. Um, and I guess the, the, the biggest actionable, actionable piece of advice I would say is always push for an MG, um, which is, uh, as you know, a minimum guarantee basically the exact same as uh, an advance that an author would get for a book. Um, you can never really tell what your sales agents are doing, like how much money they're actually getting, what they're spending on expenses and things like that. Um, they intentionally obfuscate um, the data and also, uh, at least from my experience, withhold payments and make it very difficult to even get a reply from them. So just get as much money as you can up front <laughs> and don't expect anything beyond that. Yeah. Okay. Wise words. Wise words. Um, what's, what was, what's your experience with like sales agents? And that? Varied. I'd love to tell you um, a good anecdote, but I can't. And I think... Um, it's it's a tough one because I'm I'm so me and you, Laura. You can't tell the anecdote because it's like, you know. No, no. It's, oh, it no, doesn't yeah. exist. It doesn't exist. Oh, right, the, the good anecdote. <laughs> there are there are I've, I have met uh, honest ones and worked with them, um, but they are far and few between. I think my problem is um, so this is where me and Laura's yin and yang works so well. Is I'm very sort of overly trusting. And I'll, you know, when we did the last film, we sent the film out to hundreds of people. Um, the, la the last one is... So you might get yeah. lost. Send them okay, out to loads right. of people. Um, and one would come back and I'd, and they'd go, we love your film, Italian company. I'm not going to do an Italian accent. I nearly did. Um, <laughs> they would, we love your film. Um, let's chat. And I'm like, okay, all right. So I'll have a chat with them, chat with the bloke. Oh, so passionate about the film. Just loved it, you know. He knows, I'm trying to think about how I can uh, camouflage shoes first in his bit. It's like, oh, he knows Bernardo Bertolucci's son or whatever. Do you know what I mean? He's in the connect, he's connected this bloke. He yeah. loves it. He's given me a plan about to sell it. 
amazing want to go with them then I have a conversation with Laura what do you think of this company I get I'm getting a really good vibe off of this person I think this is the one Laura does about three seconds of research and then we contact the people this person sold to which is another piece of advice if you're going to go with the sales agent speak to filmmakers who are with that sales agent yeah and that's, everybody that's we spoke to was shy star don't touch them with a barge pole so vibes mean nothing and my yeah. my initial any kind of personal connection with that person you've just got to ignore that and look at the facts so if they have they worked with filmmakers who've seen money um would those filmmakers uh recommend that person because they're the only ones who are going to give you an honest um response because the other thing is is you you know like you said um my 10 percent calculation i do is usually of 40 people two will go to the next round yeah and of those if you add up all those two people out of that 40 people two of them would give you make you an offer um yeah, yeah. and you know if your film the last film i made is was a tough sell probably like yourself it's a tough sell because it's kind of crosses a couple of genres not enough blood yeah, to be a yeah. horror and science fiction you know um so it is a tough sell so you're really trying to be careful about who you pick as a sales agent um so yeah it's it's hard not to to get depressed about that kind of stuff but yeah, you just got to yeah, focus yeah. on and enjoying making the film figuring out who the film's for when you make it but um yeah not i've not really got any good good sales agent stories unfortunately yet mm. that's that's a good place to be though <laughs> yeah yeah i'm yes. hopeful thanks for listening please do make sure you subscribe so you never miss another episode of the honest filmmaker podcast career advice from people in the business Thank you.